Good afternoon. Today's talk will be on Girish Karnar's play Tughlaq. Girish Karnar's play Tughlaq centers on the historical figure of Muhammad bin Tughlaq, a king of the Tughlaq dynasty as we may have already learned in history, who ruled from Delhi over large parts of North and Central India during the period 1325 to 1351. The play aptly fuses history and fiction, history in the form of the political figure of Tughlaq forms the main plot, fiction forms the subplot of the play in the creation of the pair Aziz and Azam, a dhobi and a pickpocket respectively. If the main plot enacts the fall of an ambitious autocrat in Tughlaq, the subplot presents an ordinary dhobi manipulating for his own benefit the schemes introduced by the king. The play fashions the character of Tughlaq as an ambitious king who wants to build a grand empire and maneuver his citizens to think as he does. To that end, he devises the grand schemes of transferring his capital from Delhi to Dawlatabad and introduces a new currency system. A lover of the game of chess, Tughlaq symbolically moves his political pawns without ethics or morality. Manipulation and cruelty apparently combine together in him to serve his delusions. Tughlaq attempts to make a show of the prevalence of justice in his kingdom by restoring to Vishnu Datta, a Hindu Brahmin, his confiscated property and by giving him an appointment in his state service. This political pretension of showing how justice prevails in Tughlaq's kingdom is manipulated by the Dhobi Aziz who presents himself in the guise of Vishnu Datta. Tughlaq is portrayed as a master of intrigue and treachery in the play. His politics do not spare even religion as we see that he invites Sheikh Imamuddin, a religious leader who criticizes him openly to address his people, but sees to it that no one attends his address. He later persuades Sheikh in the name of Islam to act as an envoy to his political rebel, Ailul Mul, only to make Sheikh the scapegoat. However, Tughlaq's tyranny makes the overlords of Delhi rebel against him we find that they hatch a plot to kill him during prayer, but he sabotages the conspiracy and murders Shihabuddin, one of the conspirators. Tughlaq gives it a political coloring by projecting that Shihabuddin died while saving the king. We find that as the play progresses, Tughlaq's ambition fails. His cruelty and disillusionment dominate the state. Not even his stepmother is spared from death. When Qiyasuddin Abbasi, the descendant of the famous Abbasid dynasty of the Caliphs of Baghdad, is on his way to visit the new capital Daulatabad, Tughlaq revives the prayer which he had ordered to stop after the conspirators' plan to finish him off. Aziz kills Abbasid on the way and supplants him in the palace by disguising himself as a descendant of the Caliph. By that time, there is chaos in the kingdom as a result of famine and counterfeit currency. In the end, Tughlaq finds himself alone. Even Barani, his confidant and constant companion, leaves him to his fate. The protagonist of Karnat's play is clearly Muhammad bin Tughlaq, a brilliant but spectacularly unsuccessful 14th century Islamic Sultan of Delhi. Karnat's primary historical source is the Tariq e Shahi, written in 1357, a chronicle history whose author Ziauddin Barani spent 17 years at Tughlaq's court but died in self-imposed poverty the year the work was completed. Using Barani's basic narrative, his attitudes and portions of his text, Girish Karnad arranges the 13 scenes of Tughlaq as a sequence of self-cancelling actions that articulate both political and psychological ironies. 
Politically, the play shows Tughlaq's futile attempts to be just and liberal towards a majority Hindu population that is obliged as an Islamic ruler perhaps to prosecute. In the first scene, which is set in Delhi in 1327, Tughlaq invites his subjects to celebrate a new system of justice which works without any consideration of might or weakness, religion or creed. But the only character apparently to benefit from this utopian move is a low-caste Muslim washerman by the name of Aziz, who assumes the identity of a poor Hindu Brahmin to win a false judgment against the Sultan and secure a position in his court. Later in the first scene, we find that Tughlaq announces his decision to shift his capital from Delhi to Deoghir, which he later renames as Daulatabad, a city 800 miles away in the Deccan Plateau, because he says Daulatabad is a city of the Hindus, and as the capital, it will symbolize the bond between Muslims and Hindus, which I wish to develop and strengthen in my kingdom. Quote this reasoning so alienates provincial Muslim noblemen and religious leaders that they plot to, plot to assassinate Tughlaq. Although Tughlaq foils the coup in his palace, he reconceives the move to the Deccan as an act of vengeance on the people of Delhi, which is in Act 5. The collective journey to Daulatabad becomes a nightmare of starvation, disease and death portrayed in scene 6 and 7, and when the action resumes in Daulatabad in the play after a five-year interval in scene 8, we see that Tughlaq subjects are hardened to a life of loneliness, punishment and violence. At the end, Tughlaq is left to contemplate in dismay the famine, rebellions and economic chaos that signal the collapse of his empire, which occurs between scenes 9 and 13. The second level ironies in the play uncover Tughlaq's sadistic, manipulative impulses and undercut his image of himself as an exemplary ruler. Developed mainly in scenes 2 and 4, these ironies show Tughlaq jockeying for position among such friends and adversaries, the historian Barani and a powerful but credulous religious rival by the name of Sheikh Imamuddin. Tughlaq's real nemesis and inverted double and Karnar's principal fictional invention in this psychodrama, however, is Aziz, who after his initial coup pairs up with his childhood friend Azam to subvert every one of Tughlaq's well-intentioned moves. During the journey to Daulatabad, for example, Aziz reappears in his Brahmin disguise to extort money from the sick and dying travelers. When Tughlaq attempts to revive the imperial economy by issuing copper coins with the same token value as gold and silver, Aziz becomes a counterfeiter of coins. In a last, despairing attempt to bring peace and legitimacy to his reign, Tughlaq invites Giyasuddin Abbasid, a descendant of the Baghdad Caliphs, to visit and sanctify his new capital, Daulatabad. But Aziz, now a highway robber murders Giyasuddin and replaces him in the palace. Tughlaq has been left entirely lonely by the time he confronts the imposter. His stepmother has been stoned to death for poisoning Prime Minister Najib and Barani has used his own mother's death as an excuse to leave the court. At the end of the play, we see that a haunted and exhausted Tughlaq acknowledges that he cannot punish Aziz because Aziz is his only future companion, his true and royal disciple. Karnad's refiguration of history and his use of the doppelganger motif create complex verbal, structural and psychological patterns which Yuvar Anantamurti incidentally analyzes in his introduction to the English translation of Girish Karnad's play. But the play's paradigmatic qualities as a historical fiction and its cultural vitality as it were derive principally from the multifold engagement with history that lies behind the words and the plot. First, Tughlaq retrieves and makes current the relatively unfamiliar phase of Islamic imperialism in India 
known as the Sultanate period from the 12th to the early 16th century, which ended the hegemony of classical Hinduism, particularly in northern India, and introduced Islam as a dominant political and cultural force on the subcontinent. The Sultanate is historically important in the record of Islamic conquest, the evolution of political institutions, and the unprecedented complication of religious interests. In the collective memory of contemporary Indian audiences, however, it has been effectively marginalized by the later periods of Mughal and British imperialism. Karnat's play reinscribes the narrative of Tughlaq in the audience's memory and the reader's memory as well, refining legend and historical tradition through a detailed historical reenactment, as it were. Secondly, through the topological resources of irony, Tughlaq participates in the dialectic of heroic and satiric discourses that has shaped European and Indian constructions of India since the late 18th century. Vinay Dharwatkar, for example, describes these antithetical, constantly interacting discourses as quote unquote, two intricately constituted bodies of knowledge, thinking, writing, reading, and interpretation, unquote, that emerge from the mutually transformative encounter between India and the West in the colonial period and continues into today's times. The heroic and satirical modes of representation are broad strategies, dramatic strategies, for respectively raising and denigrating the historical traditions, religious and philosophical systems, social and political institutions, and cultural and civic practices that constitute India as a subject. The satiric mode employs irony, invective, and ridicule for the purpose of attack. The heroic mode adopts an idealistic, romantic, or sentimental stance for the purpose of celebration. Now, having known all these issues, what impression does the character of Muhammad bin Tughlaq in the play cast on us? In other words, after going through the play, what impression do we form of the character of Muhammad bin Tughlaq? Now, we have seen that the play opens with Muhammad in the role of a secular humanist. He dreams of a kingdom that would be a land of justice and peace equality and progress. He is even ready to announce his mistakes to the whole world and to be judged in public. The announcement in scene one corroborates this. It, we know, or we are told, his merciful majesty has accepted the charge of a Brahmin that he is guilty of illegal appropriation of the poor man's land and granted compensation for the loss. The performance is sincere to adopt Irving Goffman's role-playing theory because the performer is taken in by his own act. No wonder a section of the Sultan's audience applauds. They say, and we know, this king isn't afraid to be human. And these are the exact words that they say. The expressive bias of the performance is accepted as reality. That is characteristics of a ceremony, of the ritual of ideological recognition, so to say. On the other hand, the audience reaction makes the performer conscious of how much he is observed and how much the crowd is disposed to favor all his inclinations. So Muhammad finds it the opportune moment to declare that the capital of his empire is going to be shifted from Delhi to Daulatabad, a city of the Hindus. The new capital apparently will symbolize, according to Tughlaq, the long-cherished bond between Muslims and Hindus. The Sultan's lofty view of himself and his empire then not only derives from the juridical and cultural ideals of Indian monarchy, but even becomes complicit with the idea of sovereignty as well. He believes that by his humility and deportment, he can also subject his credulous people to his authority. Central to our understanding of Tughlaq's character is perhaps the third scene of the play. The announcement and outset of scene 3 strikes us as a parallel to the announcement in scene 1. In scene 3, we see that Sheikh Imamuddin, a revered saint and the severest critic of the Sultan, 
will address a meeting to analyze the Sultan's administration. He will show apparently where the king has taken measures harmful to the country and the faith. Muhammad will be present as well in the meeting to seek direction from the Sheikh. He might never have consciously tried to go against the tenets of Islam is something which we know as settled, but he does not claim himself to be omniscient either. So he believes that the Sheikh's criticism of his inadvertent transgressions, as it were, will indeed help him complete his larger mission as a Sultan. But the conviction with which he initially sought the judgment, or the sincerity with which he wanted to act as a pious, dutiful and sincere king, soon gives way to deceit and manipulation the moment he apprehends the risk involved in such a performance. The orthodox theologian Imamuddin threatens Muhammad's secular ideals. Following the example of Alauddin Khilji, the Sultan of Delhi from 1296 to 1316, Girish Karnat's protagonist refuses to impose Islamic Sharia or canon law on his people because he feels that as a modern leader he must define his role in terms broader than those of religion. The Sheikh does not get his audience because the people are secretly barred from coming to the venue. The impression of reality the Sultan now posters and stages before the others is that he should not call on God to clean the dirt deposited by men. These are his exact words. Instead, he should rely on his own resources to find a new world. He even justifies what the Sheikh condemns as his transgressions. Namely, to live by the Quran alone would be to kill the Greek in me and deny the visions which led Jarathustra or Buddha. Again, these are his exact words. He also wishes to believe in recurring births like the Hindu, because he says, My hopes, my people, my God are all fighting for the only one life he has. Muhammad knows that his kingdom is being torn to pieces by his vision, but he cannot deny their validity at all. No wonder he gets the Sheikh eliminated after the latter's speeches have triggered off violent protests in the other parts of the country. He convinces the Sheikh that the war idol world is determined to impose on Delhi will essentially mean a slaughter of Muslims at the hands of fellow Muslims. And that is enough for Imamuddin to agree to Muhammad's proposal that he meet the enemy as the Sultan's peace emissary. As he marches towards Ayn Mok's army, looking exactly like the Sultan with the royal robes on, Muhammad's army starts the battle and kills the puzzled sheikh. Thus, Muhammad's multiple selves are all equally real, depending upon the sites of construction. In the play. The very concept of personal essences is thrown into doubt. There is no essential fundamental understanding, only a plethora of possibilities for what can one be. It is clear that Muhammad the tyrant cannot be separated from Muhammad the idealist in the way role can be from a being. Initially, the Sultan resorted to killings as a means however cruel and despicable to his idealistic end. That was a seeming unity of purpose in it, there was a seeming unity of purpose, and contrivances could be distinguished from reality, however contingent or questionable. But later subjectivity can only be multiple. Muhammad is anything but a whole. We find that he is an idealist, he is a tyrant, he is a poet, he is a civil servant, he is a self-pitying king. In scene 7, for example, he bluntly orders his people to leave for Dawlatabad by saying, and I quote, anybody who attempts to stay behind will be severely punished, unquote. Scene 8 is set in the, the Dawlatabad fort five years later. Once again, the Sultan needs an audience for his words, but this time he admits his failures. This serves to frustrate the search for unity as it were subjective or historical in the play. Muhammad wanted to reduce history. Uh, to some form of an autobiography of himself, to reduce India to his own consciousness. 
He tells the young sentry that while supervising the construction of the fort, he thought, and I quote, one day I shall build my own history like this, brick by brick, unquote. But one night, when you are standing on its ramparts, or to the ramparts of this new Dalatabad fort, the gate seemed to fall apart. Like a poet agonized over the destruction of his own creation, he goes on and says, in the last four years, I have seen only woods clinging to the earth, heard only the howls of wild wolves and the answering bay of street dogs. Unquote. By trying to make personal experience the source of public history, the play actually subverts the traditional notion of history as a non contradictory continuity. In other words, the scene questions both subjectivity and history as successive terms or forms of a primordial intention, as it were. Significantly, Muhammad confesses his frustrations to Barani as well, the historian who sees history being formed in a disjunctive manner. The introduction of copper currency, for example, has helped only one industry flourish in his kingdom, namely the industry of counterfeit coins, which we find was there in every Hindu household, as it were. And as for the charge of Barani, the experiment itself might have been a serious innovation, which historically anticipated the introduction of paper currency in China by 50 years. But Muhammad is hardly aware that communities marked by political inequality and religious difference survive through some form of continuous negative equilibrium. If the Muslim minority feels increasingly alienated for his exemplary humility towards the Hindu majority, we find that the latter often indulges in fraud as though in collective communal revenge against an alien king. A Sikh economy, threats of armed rebellion, natural calamities, all combine with each other as it were to turn the land into a honeycomb of diseases. The drought in the Doab, causing cracks in the soil, is symbolic of a fragmented king and his fractured kingdom. Muhammad still considers himself as the origin of meaning, both private and public. He says, I have something to give, something to teach, which may open the eyes of history. Unquote. He considers himself more as a shaper of history than a historical subject. However, his crisis of confidence surfaces in his final frenzied attempt to make his people, quote unquote, listen to me before I lose even that. This questions our old, sure sense of the subject in history. One has to dispense with the constituent subject, to quote, quote Foucault, to arrive at an analysis which can account for the constitution of the subject within a historical framework, unquote. This is a form of history which can account for the constitution of knowledge or knowledge essence, discourses, without having to make reference to a subject which is either transcendental in relation to the field of events or runs in its empty sameness through the course of history. So essentially, Muhammad bin Tughlaq, the historical character uh, who is framed into a play by Girish Karnad, appears interesting for us because his character is essentially a continuous conflict between his refusal to be a subject of history and his continuous thrust to make history happen. So it is essentially a conflict. The Muhammad's character is, a, is essentially a conflict between a person who is uncomfortable with the fact that he will only be one among the many subjects of history rather than as one who created history by an incident. His shift of capital from Delhi to Dawlatabad which came at enormous cost, can be seen as one such attempt by the Sultan to cause history rather than becoming the subject of history. So this essentially is the abiding character of Muhammad bin Tughlaq, as we find in Girish Karnad's play Tughlaq. So this is all that I had to tell you in the form of a discussion with regard to Girish Karnad's Tughlaq. Thank you.